Hey there! In this episode of Mind Pump, we talk about what bodybuilders can learn from powerlifters and what powerlifters can learn from bodybuilders. We also talk about reverse band exercises and a lot of other topics. It feels incredible and your strength goes through the roof when you train this way. In the second half of the episode, we have four live callers where we answer questions such as, Hey, I can't do pull-ups. Oh! How can I do one? And we teach all about how to do that. Also, we talk about switching from a split to a full body routine. What did he say? Oh. Hey, you might want to try that. Finally, if you want short clips from this show, go to our YouTube channel, Mind Pump Clips, and subscribe. All right, enjoy the show. Powerlifters have it half right and half wrong. Bodybuilders also have it half right and half wrong. There's a lot you can learn from both if you want to maximize your gains. You right. got to explain that. Right. So, so, so power lifters, or if you train with a power lifting mentality, right? Low reps, you're trying to maximize strength. The goal is to make the weight feel as light as possible. Like if you ever train with a power lifter, they're really good at maximizing biomechanics and mm -hmm. leverage and, and the technique of the lift, right? right. They're not they're, thinking about the muscles. That not are, at all. They're just like, moving the weight. They're moving the as weight. As effectively as possible. Yes. And they're trying to make it light. They're trying to make it feel light. Whereas a bodybuilder, what they're trying to do is they're trying to take an exercise and how can I make this weight feel as heavy as possible? How can I make the weight feel harder to create more tension on the muscle? Both have tremendous value. Both build muscle. Both are valuable skills depending on the, the phase of training that you're in. Completely I, different mindsets. Yes. Well. I love this tip because I actually think this, this takes a while of training consistently uh, before you learn to like really apply this into your into your programming totally and what i mean by that is all of us whether we like it or not tend to identify somewhat to some camp right mm -hmm. as much as we talk about how we all of us uh tend to gravitate towards a way of training if i were to critique myself um i gravitate towards more of a bodybuilder type of mentality when i lift <clears throat> if i were to critique you two i think you guys gravitate more towards a strong man or power lifting and so what does that mean well that means when Justin and Sal go to do 15, 20 reps, they have a tendency probably to want to put more weight on the bar and lift as much weight as they can for those 15 reps. Right. Mm -hmm. What I tend to do with uh, power lifting reps, if I'm doing five, let's say one to five reps, I have a tendency to not put enough weight on the bar because I'm trying to feel my glutes and squeeze or feel my back right. and squeeze. And so learning how to take yourself out of that, that character and think like the the person that tends to gravitate towards that type of rep range and learn how to apply that into your program. That takes a lot of skill. Oh, if you've ever worked out, if you've ever done like a low rep training cycle with a bodybuilder or a high rep training cycle with a power lifter, you could clearly see this. The power lifter doing the cable crossovers and the laterals and the other stuff. It's like they have their the same power lifting mentality. It's about biomechanics and leverage. Whereas with the bodybuilder, you take them and you have them deadlift and you can tell, like, what are you trying to do? You're trying to feel your lats. You're trying to squeeze yeah. your back. Don't do that. Just lift the weight in the most efficient, effective way possible. And like MAPS Anabolic, for example, is a great example of this. Phase one, the goal is to lift the weight and do it in the most effective, efficient way possible. You get to phase two and phase three, the weight isn't as important. It's about making the weight feel heavy. And if you, cr if you cross those over... You mess up the whole thing. Well, the clearest example I always see is when a bodybuilder goes to deadlift and you see like they're a bend in their elbow and, and, yes. and they're always like pulling with a lot of upper body uh, strength and really trying to muscle it up as opposed to, you know, using that leverage and like their whole body uh, in, in, in this like simultaneous type of a, a fluid movement uh, to pull it up off the ground. And then on the other end of it, seeing, you know, a, a power lifter, like somebody like me, <laughs> like when we were in uh, Ben Pikulski's Pikulski's gym, gym yeah. and I'm like, you know, just trying to get through the reps and, and, you know, if I'm doing like, let's say like a lateral raise or something and I'm just, I'm doing the reps and he's slowing me way down and grinding my way through and like every little detail of the angle yes. of, you know, where I'm, where I'm trying to pull like matters substantially. Well, let's unpack it a little bit more, right? Like what are some of the characteristics that are positive about each of those like types of like great direction, right? So a bodybuilder does like 
uh, they, they they a lot of times incorporate a little an isometric pause. They're slow. The tempo is slow and controlled. They squeeze at the top like they're thinking about the muscle. Like so, weight is 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 not normally a major focus. Yes, they progressively overload and lift more weight, but they are trying to make that weight as heavy as possible. They're more into the technique. They're more into slowing the tempo down and squeezing. When you go over to the the power lifter or bodybuilder. I mean, it's speed, firing your CNS, like mm -hmm. explosiveness, like just moving the weight as, as fast and as hard as you possibly can. Very, very different adaptations. And so if you train in, in, in that way or like that way for a long period of time, and then you ask each of those characters to move into the the opposite type of rep range, meaning the opposite side of the spectrum, like the the bodybuilder who does you know supersets, fifteen to twenty reps, a lot of pumping stuff, and say, okay, now I want you to run singles. He still thinks like a bodybuilder, yes. and he wants to apply that to the one to five. And the opposite is true for the powerlifter who lifts one to five reps and grind and explosive fire in the scene. And then he goes over to do 15 reps and he tries to apply that, you know, speed, explosive, you know, grinding type of reps to the the bodybuilder or the hypertrophy type training. And they Did both you, have a lot to learn from each other. 100%. Okay, so here's the, the big discrepancies I can see. Let's use an exercise like the bench press. Technique, let's start with that. Power lifter is, is they're both, by the way, I want to say this before we continue. They're both technical. Yeah. A bodybuilder and a power lifter are both focusing on technique, but what they're focusing on is different. The power lifter is modifying the technique to maximize leverage. How can I change my technique and positioning and form to lift the most amount of weight? The bodybuilder is thinking technique as well, but what they're thinking is, how can I move and change my body and positioning to feel this the most in the chest? Increase their time under tension. Yes, two very different things. And then let's talk about stress on the muscle. The power lifter, although they're not necessarily thinking stress on the muscle because they're thinking weight, their primary means of doing so is, extrin is uh, extrinsic. Extrinsic. I'm saying that wrong. There you go. It's adding weight to the bar, whereas a bodybuilder is more intrinsic. Can I make this feel harder mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by squeezing and contracting the muscle? They're both valuable. Yes. With the power lifter, you're teaching, first off, you're learning your really good leverage and technique for maximizing the amount of weight you can lift, and that's going to carry over into the bodybuilding style training. You're also creating tremendous tension. You're also teaching your, your muscles how to organize and work together mm -hmm. to lift something, which is a very valuable skill that you have to learn and strengthen because that's what makes you strong in the real world. Bodybuilders, what's the value there? They can target hypertrophy. They can target and focus, right? If a power lifter is, if you're always benching like a power lifter and it just doesn't activate your chest as much because that's the best leverage for you, you're not going to develop the most muscular chest doing it that way versus a bodybuilder who can change their positioning to focus and feel on the area that they want to target. And by the way, would a power lifter whose technique doesn't activate the chest as much and has good leverage, would they benefit from still having a bigger chest? They would. Mm -hmm. So them switching over to some bodybuilding training, get some hypertrophy, they would actually get stronger and vice versa. The power, the bodybuilder would gain from learning how to organize their muscles in a way to maximize force. So there's tremendous value, but the key here to understand, if, if you're listening to this and you don't care about competing in either sport, the key, the, the thing you want to understand here is if you're lifting in really low rep ranges, train like the best people who lift in low rep, rep ranges. Yeah. Train like them. Who's the best strength athletes in low rep ranges? Power lifters. So one, you want to follow their mentality and their focus. Well, who are the best people at targeted hypertrophy? Bodybuilders. So when you get in those hypertrophy rep ranges, the 12 and 15 rep ranges where you're getting the pump and your target sculpting your body, you want to follow their mentality and learn from both. And then if you cycle between them, do phases, you end up minimizing the negatives because what are the negatives of powerlifting training? Eventually you start to get joint pain. Mm -hmm. uh, you start to stress uh, your, basically the seams, fried, right? Yeah. yeah, you start to fry yourself a little bit. What are the negatives of the bodybuilding training? Well, you don't get the muscle density you don't get the ability to really fire your muscles in a unified way, as organized as, as you'd yeah, like. You're like compartmentalized. Yeah, you become you, you can kind of become very compartmentalized. You'll see this with bodybuilders, by the way. When you ever try and have a bodybuilder do a, like a kettlebell swing, mm -hmm. yeah. it's like they're doing a, a front shoulder raise, you know, reverse Squat, curl type of deal. Right. So they both can benefit. You can benefit from learning both. What you don't want to do is use the wrong mentality for the wrong training cycle. That's when things get mixed up. Well, the the, the the true masters of kinesiology have the ability to to move in and out of this. I yes. mean, that's when I see somebody who is really, really understands human movement 
and understands all these different, the values of all these different modalities, like you have that. I mean, it takes a lot of self-awareness. It takes, a, a, I think, a lot of practice. Like this is not a year one of lifting. Have you figured this out? I mean, it takes some time under the bar to be able to figure this out, how to do this. And I don't, and this can't be overstated. The, the mental aspect of training for long-term success is, it's the most important part. It's more important than anything else. And the reason why, if you follow one of our maps programs, the way we phase our workouts are typically in three and four week blocks. So for three or four weeks, you're training this low rep range. The mentality is more like a power lifter. You're looking at leverage and technique in that particular context. And then, okay, phase three or phase two, higher reps, trying to get a pump, change the mentality, train more like a bodybuilder, focus on the glutes, focus on the hamstrings, the lats, the pecs, whatever the exercise calls for. The reason why we phase them that way versus Monday is heavy, Wednesday is light, Friday is in between, like because studies show that both, uh, both methods seem to be relatively equal in terms of muscle growth. But I disagree because the, the mental- Psychological component. Getting into the mental yeah. space of training like a power lifter typically takes me- Three or four workouts. Mm -hmm. Three or four workouts into it, now I've got the feel for the lifts. For the bodybuilding style, it's the same thing. Getting out of that powerlifting mentality, getting into feel the muscle, not pay attention so much to the weight, that requires a, a, another three or four workouts. And when I switch back and forth, it, it can sometimes get mixed up, and I'm experienced, so I can't imagine the average person trying to do something like that. Mm -hmm. I, I would like to add to this conversation another very valuable uh, you know, character to emulate would be the uh, athlete. Yeah. You know, cause that's a whole nother mindset and way of thinking going in your training totally. too. Like the, the, the ability to stabilize and decelerate and accelerate explosively. Accelerate. And and control. And control yeah. yeah. And, and with speed, right. And power. Like, yeah. I mean, those, all three of those are, are very unique. You know, when you think of a power lifter, bodybuilder, and then you think of like the athlete slash maybe Olympic lifter would be like if someone who would be close to explaining that. And like, those are, they, they're very different the way you approach the bar and how you lift the weight. So I will say this like about- Fast, uh, loose. About, think, oh God, you hit yeah. the nail on the head. Athletes, un, so power lifters understand tension and like, let's just ramp up the CNS and go, right? And a power lifter would be more like an athlete in terms of strength sports than a, the bodybuilder, more so, right? Because they compete in actual like competition in that sense. Athletes, they know how to be tense and they also know when to be loose. Mm -hmm. So if you watch an athlete play a sport, when they need to turn it up, it is fire. Muscles are on. And when they need to be loose, they be loose. Why? Because you can't be tense all the time. You're going to die. After five minutes- Tension at, restricts movement. Yes. So that's a great- I'm so glad, glad you said that because learning how to do like mobility and train in multiplanar movements and have an athletic mindset is neither bodybuilder or powerlifter. That's right. In mm -hmm. fact, if you go into- that kind of stuff, training like a, first off, you train like a bodybuilder, you're not going to move well because you're going to think bicep, tricep, shoulder. It's not going to work that way. Yeah. If you think like a power lift, you need to gas out after 30 seconds because you got to know when to be loose, when to conserve energy and when to expel well, it's it. A, yeah. It's interesting to think about because it is kind of the ultimate hybrid of those mentalities and, and to be able to generate as, as much force as you can from like your power lifter. So the power lifter's entire process is to just generate as much force as possible and then uh, have the mechanics to go through that movement as efficiently as they can. Uh, whereas, you know, the athlete it wants to be able to spark uh, that type of, of force production, but then control that and, and be loose to, to be able to manipulate their body so they can, they can propel their body yeah. in certain directions uh, in a fluid way. But then bring it back under control right away. So it's like, it gets, in terms of complexity, I would say, uh, well, I guess powerlifting and bodybuilding are probably somewhat equal, but but then that's sort of another layer of of components. Oh, I would consider. say athletic is, is the pinnacle. Oh, that's the ultimate that's, expression. That's the pinnacle, yeah, because you're, you know, that's definitely you're expressing everything. You gotta put it all together. Yeah, because I mean, we the, the closest thing that you would relate to that outside of like sport, sport specific training would be Olympic lifting. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that is the pinnacle That would be the one sort of in between, I would yeah, say. Yeah, no, it's absolutely the, the pinnacle. I just, I mean, uh, one, uh, this tip that I know you didn't intend for this to be like this massive maps commercial, but I mean, literally this is, this is why I recently came out and said like, man, I would love to hear from somebody who literally goes through every single maps program and follows it to a T because we have thought about that in the programming of all of these, mm -hmm. that you should get some of that application throughout all, all these programs as you go through them. And when you get done, like you have a lot of tools in your tool belt. And this is something I, I take a lot of pride in the fact that I can, I can get in the gym and I can lift 
and look kind of like a power. If I if you saw me deadlift and squat, I've got pretty good depth and range, got pretty good form and technique that you could and I can lift pretty good weight. It's like, oh, okay, I'm not the strongest guy in the gym by any means, mm -hmm. but it's like, oh, that guy can that guy can power lift pretty well. He's strong like that. Then I can also get out there, I could do a jump box and look like an athlete uh when I do it. And then I get out there and I can train with great control and technique like a bodybuilder and move in and out of that stuff. And, and by the way, training in these different modalities, just for people who are more aesthetic focused, actually produces the best aesthetics. And and I need to explain that for a second. Aesthetics isn't just how you look posing in a picture. Aesthetics in the real world is you're watching someone move and walk. Yep. Okay. You're watching someone squat down or sit down or or twist and turn. So aesthetics isn't just how ripped and muscular you look when you're standing posing, but rather also how you move. And we've all seen that guy or girl, right? They, they look really amazing standing still, but as soon as they start moving, they look very non-fluid, almost awkward, right? So all this type of training produces a muscular, lean, fluid physique that actually gives you real aesthetics in the real world. You look healthy and you look like you can move really well. I, I remember experiencing that in jujitsu. You know, there were guys that were brown belts and black belts, so very experienced doing jujitsu for nine to 10 years who I could I could cream them with stamina and endurance and strength in the gym. At the time, this is when I was doing jujitsu for a while, I could beat them in stamina. I could beat them in a circuit. I could beat them lifting. But then we'd hit the mats and I'd be gassed out. And those guys would be like, whatever. And I and they would tell me it's because they're like, I know when to relax. Mm -hmm. Like you're sitting there tense this whole time mm -hmm. and they know how to relax and flow. You ever ride, um, remember the first few times you rode like a dirt bike and you're going over bumps and you're just so tired because you're just holding on so yeah, hard? because you're so tense. Yes. So athletes know how to do that. And that's an important skill as well. And training like an athlete, you know, uh, MAPS performance has got some phase, phase twos like that, where you got to learn how to do that. You're going to die. Like yeah, you do the matrix the lunges. You, and all, yeah, you acquire through practice. And then that's the biggest thing is like most athletes are going to be uh, rigid like that. They're mm -hmm. going to be stiff. They're going to be tense. Uh, and, and it takes it, your, your, your body already has these natural governings in place to keep you safe and protect your joints and all that stuff. It takes, you know, that many, um, hours and hours of, of practice to be able to, uh, provide that feedback that everything's going to be safe and is under control. And you have the strength and ability to control your body on that level. Yes. I think for the general population that's listening, one of the things to take away that is, we all tend to gravitate towards a, a way of training yes. or identify as a group. And the more you challenge yourself, other is the, the more uh, benefits that you can receive, yeah. right? Like mm -hmm. if you always train like a bodybuilder and you apply, and you ask, you manipulate rep ranges and things like that, but you still apply that mindset into the way you lift all the time. Like you're only allowing yourself to reap so, so many benefits from training through all when you learn to move in, in, in and out of these modalities and take those mentalities into lifting, yeah. you'll you'll open up more. more. Yeah. Each one of these avatars have desirable characteristics. I mean, if anything you've seen in the fitness arena, you've seen like those like few things. If you say like bodybuilding, like you'll you'll pick those aesthetic focuses out. Like this is my desired outcome. I want those right out of here. Or if I'm an athlete, I want to be able to move at this, you know, level and, and be explosive. And you could do that along the board of all these different types of avatars we create, but there's something to be said about like being able to extract those characteristics mm -hmm. and incorporate, you know, all of those. And even for people who compete in these sports, there's someone listening. He's like, well, I'm a power lifter. Like I compete in power lifting. Well, you don't, you don't have to devote equal time to bodybuilding style training and to mobility as you do to powerlifting, but it will benefit you to dip into those to break up your normal training cycle. So it, it would be great if you're, if you do like a 12 week powerlifting block, it'd be good to throw in a couple weeks of bodybuilding or mobility focused type training and you'll end up just getting strong. You're going to, same you're, thing with a bodybuilder. You're going to need yeah. to eventually. And I'll tell you why, you know, you know what eventually happens is you hit your goal. Like, so I admittedly, I 100% identified as the, the bodybuilder type of guy for, well, then uh, eventually I hit my, my ultimate bodybuilding goal. And then it was kind of like, oh, boring. Yeah. What now? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I reached the, the, the pinnacle of that, that this thing that I had been chasing my whole life as a young boy into young adulthood into training. And then you reach that and it's like, oh, well, I want this to be a lifelong pursuit. Well, I no longer have this big goal anymore because I've achieved it. So it's kind of like, I just, I just keep doing the same thing over. And then, and it's, I'm always going to fall short now of what that like. So 
for me, for sanity reasons, and I think that everybody will eventually reach this if you're super focused on one thing. If you want to be the best OCR racer, you want to be the best power, you eventually kind of reach that goal. And if you're if you're not only just doing that for this specific goal or sport or thing you like, and you want this to be a yeah. lifelong pursuit of health, you're gonna need to have you're gonna need to move out of that, or True. else it, you're you're just be letting yourself down all the time. I mean, if I compared my my physique always to my my top physique at, that I've had before, I'm gonna be let down about my training all the time. So I have but I you had can to have better mobility. Myself. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I had to force myself to go like, okay, I'm no longer the bodybuilding guy. I need to identify as the mobility guy for a while or the strength guy for a while you know or the sport guy for a while like you it's i think it's it's important to do that if you want to make this a lifelong pursuit this is all fitness wisdom is what it is you talk to people who've been doing it for a long time like mm -hmm. 10 plus years consistently who are people who worked out consistently for 10 years are very likely to work out for the rest of their life to, yeah. to keep it consistent that's fitness wisdom so that's the kind of advice that's going to help you stay consistent and do this uh, forever Here's the giveaway for today's episode, MAPS Strong. This is the strongman-inspired resistance training program. You can get it for free. Here's how you win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all of those things. If we like your comment, we'll notify you in the comment section that you won free access to MAPS Strong. We won't notify you any other way. So there's a lot of people out there trying to rip people off. It's the comment section. That's what you'll see if you won or not. Also, three days left. For the big sale we're doing this month, the Skinny Guy Bundle, which includes all these programs, is 50% off. And the Fit Mom Bundle, which includes all these other programs, is also 50% off. Again, this sale ends in three days, 72 hours, and then it's over, and it won't come back till probably next year. So if you want to get set up, click on the link at the top of the description below to get the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. I have just figured out that the PRX racks are really set up exceptionally well for band either assistance or resistance to add to the bar. I just, I, you left them up on there and I did it for the first time the other day. It's set up, it's so perfect. It is, I don't know why I didn't think it was. Same here. I was just looking around and I saw. Because so, I don't know. Did you think that they, do you think they intended it? No. To, no, I don't think so either. It's just a pull-up bar. And then they also have the safeties underneath. So, so okay. So to kind of break down what's going on, if uh, this is a wonderful training technique and a way to really advance your progress, especially if you're already advanced, you can add bands. So with the PRX racks, it, it folds up against the wall. So the thing with PRX is it's designed to minimize space. So if you have like a small area, when it's up against the wall, it comes off like, I don't know, like not even 12 inches, right? No, so I think six, I think Douglas. It's actually four. Oh, four, four inches? inches. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. <laughs> then you crazy. pull the rack and it kind of folds off the wall, hits the floor, super stable. It's actually more stable than a traditional commercial rack. And now you have yourself a normal squat rack. Well, it has a pull-up bar. And so what I'll do, what I did was I set up the bench press and then I attached bands uh, around the pull-up bar and then put them around the bar. So now I'm getting band assistance. So meaning the weight is heaviest at the top, lightest at the bottom. So it's kind of matching my strength curve. And it feels incredible and your strength goes through the roof when you train this way. And the other thing you could do with the safeties is I take the bands and put them around the bottom of the safeties around the, the, the bar to add resistance. Mm -hmm. So now it's harder as I push up or squat or whatever. It's perfect. All you need are bands. Everything's right there. Yeah, I haven't done that with the PRX yet, but that was definitely a go-to for me for quite a, a bit. You know, it's just it's a great addition, especially if you're if you're feeling any kind of plateau or anything yes. with the weight that you've been putting up. It's it's one of those kind of in between methods to really you know get you to break through. I wouldn't have thought to do it except for he left the bands up there, and I was doing incline press that day. It was just a couple of days ago. And I was like, oh, you know what? It's been forever since I've done. And we, of course, we just had a conversation with one of our friends and we were talking about yeah. what a great tool. Yeah, reverse bands. Yeah, or, yeah, bands were and stuff like that. And that's what always happens to me. Like we have, we talked to one of our really smart friends and we're talking about different, and still I go like, oh man, it's been a long time since I applied that. And I, sure enough, Sal had left the bands up there. And I just, I didn't think PRX was set up well for that. I really didn't. I just assumed that because I didn't see any like, Hooks specifically because some some of these racks well, some and things have hooks. Yeah, we'll have in. specific hooks that you're like, oh, no, that's it's got the it. safeties on the bottom. It's yeah. just easy to put the bands around, and then the pull-up bar, and it's right underneath, right on top of or yeah. underneath where the yeah. bar would. No, go. it was great. It was great. I hadn't done that in a long. You know time, what I so. like about it the, besides the strength gains and stuff because I, I get really strong really fast when I use bands. Um, and in addition to the weight, what I really like about it is when I start to feel aches and pains. Mm -hmm. If you start to feel aches and pains, like uh, like hip pain from your squatting or, or knee pain or you know maybe pain at the insertion when you're benching here at the pec, 
use the bands for assistance and it allows you to train with a high intensity and you feel almost nothing on those areas. I did it today. So I have a little strain here at, at the insertion of my pack and I used the bands today and it's like, pfft. I couldn't, and I, I pushed it with the intensity. I couldn't yeah, have done it's that. It's a lot with smoother this. resistance. Yeah, yes. I don't really know how to describe it other than that. It's really weird. Yeah. You got, what do you, uh, you know, what do you think of comparing that to uh, Mark Bell's tool that he created that I know that was his invention? Oh, the sling, the yeah. slingshot. Yeah. yeah. So I, so I like the slingshot lot. I think it's way more convenient. You don't need to attach bands to anything. So yeah. slingshot, you could use on any bench. Similar sort of premise. I mean, it, you get that elastic energy potential, I guess is what they yeah. call that. And then, um, you know, gives you that, um, help right at the very bottom of the lift of where you need it the most and, you know, sort of comes. So it, it, it all like goes within the same premise of what you yeah. So what up. I didn't like about the slingshot was that it, it, it pulled, I was just going to say, my, it, it, it changes your technique. Yeah, it changes. That's not how I would bench, right? right. So it's not, that's not exactly where my elbows were. Where yeah, you have to focus yeah, it's on It's more play. narrow uh, almost. Yeah, yeah. yeah. on that too. And so when, I, when I'm when i wanting just, if, when I'm just playing with the strength curve, which is what we're doing with bands, um, I don't want to have to manipulate my normal technique because I'm looking for the carryover when I don't have the assistance, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. The idea is that I can just get rid of these bands and now I'm, and I feel like, and I know that, and, and the tool is awesome because I know Mark has got all kinds of stuff to back, like how much it has helped benching and stuff like that. And you, it absolutely can. Oh, I love it. Pain. Yeah, I so use it. This yeah. isn't by far. This is not, or by any means, this is not a yeah. knock on the tool. I just prefer. I've used it a lot. I just prefer the bands. Well, so that. it makes what a difference on the size too, like because I the I was using one that was a little too small. It was <laughs> pinch, you know, to like restrict a little bit of blood flow. And and big old pipes it, you got there. Yeah, you know what you know what it is is the the slingshot encourages uh, powerlifter bench press. Yeah. It encourages that tucked kind of yeah. tricep tight. If, yeah. yeah, if you're going for like a, a bodybuilder bench, what I found is that because yeah. you know elbows more flared, it you have to like really extend your elbows out and oh you can't force. not with that thing right yeah, yeah you can't and it that. makes the bench kind of different right it yeah. makes it different so yeah. i like the bands uh, a little bit more on that on that one yeah. all right so did you guys um hear about i think it was walmart is removing their checkout their self checkout standards they're doing that now that's not the only thing they're doing yeah i swear i've because i've heard that um was it uh, whole foods because amazon took them over they were gonna like overhaul the whole foods at one point and you're just gonna be so, able to walk so they, that is happening it that's is? still going on okay. yeah it's called amazon go stores i believe is yeah. what it's called and okay. then what he's referring to i believe has to do with theft yes oh so and then there's not just walmart there's like a lot of grocery store chains that are getting rid of their self-checkout because theft has exploded recently and it's really? obviously due to the prices of everything have just inflated like crazy. And I'm sure people, you know, when inflation goes crazy, it's like the people at the bottom that really suffer who are like, oh, I barely saved 20 bucks a month. Like, what am I going to do now? So hmm. I guess those self-checkouts make it easy to steal. So they like put it in the bag and then yeah. you don't Like you go up with your cart it. and you just, yeah. And, and you know, to be honest with you, if I think about it, when I do self-checkout, like I could totally take a bunch it's of shit. Like yeah, there's people, there's easily, one person not watching. Not very well over. managed. Yeah. Well, what is um? Oh, I can't, I, I can't believe I can't think of the name. There's a term for uh that when you're with. I mean, we had a 24 hour fitness. I remember when that was so what, uh, loss prevention. Yeah, well, that's LP is what you is the the comp or the part of the department that's yeah. responsible for. It. It's is it called shrink or is it called? Oh, oh, oh. oh there's a there's a yeah. name for it, right? I'm, it's like at the tip of my tongue right now. I can't think of what it's called. It's, so it's, it's like a predictable amount that you yeah, exactly. Get I mean, a lot of companies just factor. I mean, 20. I didn't know it until I had to you manage. Have to factor this. it in. Yeah, you just factor it in. So, oh, we have, and I'm just going to call it shrink for now until Doug figures out what the actual term is. I don't think that's it. Um, that you know, you we have. You know, this is our average every ten month. to fifteen thousand every month. Mm -hmm. It's like, whoa. Yeah. And I remember when, when we, bef I was there before LP came on and then LP came later on. And one of the biggest offenders was our own employees. Mm -hmm. Yes. Own employees. Same when I worked at the restaurant. <laughs> See, I mean, I wonder, what is what it called? Is shrinkage. Oh, it is shrinkage. Yeah, shrinkage. Yeah. Okay. So I was right. Okay. So, <laughs> it's like when you take a cold like, shower. Yeah. When yeah. you walk out of the pool and it's <laughs> so cold. It is, so yeah. it is shrinkage. Yeah. So we, yeah. we, we would uh, uh, adjust for that. And I remember. <laughs> they have to adjust for shrinkage. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know about your husband over there. No, no. But it was, a, it was a really high number. I mean, you figure thousands of dollars per, per facility. And when you're talking about 24 Fitness or Walmart, how many locations does Walmart have? You're talking about millions yep. millions of dollars that you're you know losing. walmart's the biggest employer in america yeah i know mm. so you know what's funny about that is uh and i remember talking to i actually fired well i fired many people for stealing 
but I got rid of somebody for uh, for for stealing from the gym, right? So it was a corporate gym, big 24 fitness locations, right? So like, I don't know how many, at the time we had 200 something locations. And uh, they, I fired him for stealing a protein bar. And I remember them being like, what's the big deal? It's just, it's a big corporation. Like, who am I hurting? I said, do you know that, that they have to account for all this loss? Takes away from the profit, which means people like you, me, and everybody else gets paid less and we have to charge the consumer more. So although you feel like it doesn't affect you, it actually does. In fact, right now you got caught and you got fi- you're getting fired. But besides that, you think it's this nameless, faceless entity, Mm -hmm. but because of this, and you think you get away with it, maybe you do, but the times you do buy things, all those prices reflect their shrinkage that they have to calculate. Mm -hmm. So when they do that 10,000, 15,000 a month calculation, that goes into the price of products, services, and goods, which for the honest person who's barely making ends meet- so That's not cool. initially, when you mentioned this to me off air, the, my first thing was, oh, okay, well, of course, you know, uh, Walmart attracts lower income and then things like inflation are tighter. So, of course, it's just going to drive people and then it's easy to steal. So, yeah. it's going to drive them to steal. But actually, maybe it's employees. Maybe it's more employees. Hmm. Maybe it's employees, employees who are did, always a maybe two employees who are in, in an inflationary economy right now who didn't get a raise mm-hmm. and are getting paid low wages while well, everything is increasing within their the place that they work and they're kind of like fuck the man. Well, bro, and they have that same attitude. Think about how easy this would be. Yeah. You're the one kid who's working the the self checkout stands, right? So there's what is it normally what six or eight, and there's one person watching, and your friend knows to come shop at the time you're there. Yeah. You're gonna turn a blind eye. That's that's what I think is happening. I think it's like my buddy works at this time. I show up, take a couple steaks. Nobody knows the difference. I've done that when we were kids. Did you really? I did. Oh, I did. Uh-huh. Is this your? Yeah, it's my is bad, this confessional. Bad years, your right? confession. Uh, I am. I just made me. Th- I hadn't even had thought about that memory in a long time. My, at a grocery of, store. Yeah, my best friend was. A, uh, my best friend was a checker at this uh, at this, this grocery store called New Deal when we were kids. We were like 16, 17 years old. And I remember that we would come in late at night and we'd fill up our grocery cart. And then he would, we would know when the, he would know because he knows where the manager is and when they would go in the back to do like inventory or something. And then we would go through and we would, we would pay for some, but it would be like skip three things, pay for. So it yeah. looked like, so we'd go through the whole process. And I mean, we'd probably take something that was a, you know, three, $400 grocery bill and make it like a $50 grocery bill or something like that. We did that several times. You know, I, kids. so I, I, I only stole one time in my life and it was beads of all things. Do you guys remember when <laughs> I know you guys are like, what's going on here beads, before yeah. you make fun of me? All right. Do you know this is where the hippie fascination comes? No, from. no. Yeah. Do you guys remember when parkas were the thing? The oh, big yeah. sport, like football. Starter parkas? Yes. Dude? Yeah. Yes. And so where I went to where I went to school, I don't know if it was a thing where you guys, when you guys went to school, but uh, I had a, I had a San Francisco 49er parka I got for Christmas. It was like a hundred bucks. My parents got it for me. I begged for it. And then the cool thing was to put the the drawstrings to put beads on them. I don't know if you guys remember this. Do you guys, yeah. do, do you guys do this? Yes, totally did. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to get beads. I went with my buddies. These were all bad influences. These weren't the, gre- the greatest friends. And they were like, just take them, dude. Just take them. And under that pressure, you know, that, that whatever. And I oh. could have bought them, but I took them. I swear to God, I, every day, um, not every day, but I regret it so much. Every time I think about it, I'm like, what an idiot. I was like five. Well, I mean, I think bucks. at that age, I mean, when I think back to I like, was doing it more to be cool, I think. You yeah. Know? yeah, that was my, my, I was, we didn't have a lot of money. I was actually living on my own by this time and had my own stuff to pay for. So I justified it so like you had, that. you had real reasons. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I mean, I still think they're, they're unexcusable, right? And yeah. I think as a, a, my probably as a young kid, you know, I, I didn't understand how it works and I don't understand how that trickles down to everybody. I'm really, yeah. ultimately, I'm fucking a lot more people than the guy who I think is rich who's, and I think that's the problem. I think too many people, I mean, God, that's wrong, what's wrong with our society right now is we think that, you know, oh, it's the rich or it's, oh, this guy, get over. And it's like, man, I, I potentially, if I do, if I do that and 10 sport. other people do that, yeah. and then there's a, a single mother who works two jobs, who needs that job, who now gets laid off because their profit margins are gone. Like, you don't think like that. You no. know what I'm saying? You're a 16 year old punk kid. I'm thinking selfishly just about me, my needs, this and that. And I'm comparing it to the guy who's at the top of this and how rich he is. And it's like, man, it's like you, if someone, if I had somebody that was wise enough to, to sit me down and explain that to me, I think I'm a good enough person that I would have put that together. But right away, you, the way you justify it is like, oh, the man, it's the man. He's rich. It's like he's not going to, yeah. what, he's not going to miss $75 worth Dude, of groceries. You know? I, my, my buddy, my, uh, I'll say my cousin, so I don't have to say a name. I have so many cousins, so they won't, nobody's going to know who it was. But my cousin got caught. Cause he did the same thing, peer pressure. And he, him and his friend would steal ties from Macy's and then return them at another Macy's, get store credit and get what they wanted. Cause ties were easy to steal. 
got caught. And my family's very, they're old school. You don't steal. You're honest. Man, his dad sat him down and he just, if, when he talks about it to this day, you can see the look on his face like, I let my, I disappointed my dad so bad. Like he felt yeah. so terrible. They made him, he had to go back, return everything. They threatened to put him in jail. His dad's like, if that's what you guys are going to do, that's what you got to do. You got to pay yeah. the price. So, but luckily that they let him off the hook. But so man. does this mean then uh, for Walmart that they're going to add checkers again and yep. like employ more people yeah. in replace of that? Yeah. Cause I think what they're calculating is the loss versus the extra cost of employing yeah. someone. And yeah. they're like, oh, we're going to lose this much less. Huh. If we have you know, it people. sucks when it backfires and they realize that it's the employees that were already stealing. They just hire <laughs> yeah. more employees. <laughs> it's so bad to say that. But oh, man. Maybe that was well, the plan. It'll be <laughs> very clear at that point, <laughs> yeah, right? Like, yeah. we've narrowed like, it down. Second, we hired more people. We got more theft going on. Hey, yeah, yeah, <laughs> hey when the robot revolution happens, <laughs> you laid us off. You laid us you off. You know what? When you Originally, <laughs> when you off. had Walmart and those, I thought you were, you know, Walmart is getting in the banking. I, I heard you say this. Yeah. Dad, dad, Doug, dad. 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 Dad, were you- uh dad. Yes, oh, son. <laughs> hey, Freudian slips today. I don't know. Yeah, see, you guys go on a lot of trips. Hey, together. Daddy, would you uh, oh. would you look up uh, Walmart into the banking <laughs> banking <laughs> sector? Doug's, yeah. Doug's definitely the he's the the dad. <laughs> look this up, Dad. Time my shoes. And while you're doing that, tell me about your your thieving stories. I know you were a big thief when you were younger. Oh, I'll, bit- I can tell you one story that I'm aware of. I, I may have done it more than once, but I remember. A friend of mine had a, not a friend, it was a neighbor. He had a softball. And for some reason, I wanted that softball, so I took it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I I remember that to this day, though, because- You're it, going to hell, Doug. It ate at me, right? <laughs> yeah. Did he ever it find out, or did you give it back? Or no, I don't think he yeah. ever found out. I think it, the only- it Doug took, is like- I think, I'm, I'm, I think I may have eventually just taken it and threw it back into his garage. You're, pre- you're, you're like <laughs> one of the best people I know. Seriously, I'm not joking. So to hear you tell that, it yeah. just cracks me up. Yeah. Doug will never do- He yeah, does nothing wrong. Mine's pretty weak. I didn't tell any, but uh, it was just like a pack of gum, and then we got caught, and Ooh. I had to put it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but- <laughs> well, the, the other one, twenty five cent pack. Well, Adam, Adam was, robbed a bank or something. Yeah, <laughs> dude. Oh, yeah, I was hanging out with, get the grocery store <laughs> store. That's as far as I'm gonna go. For sure, I was hanging out with dudes though that were doing like B and E's, and I oh, was like, wow. and, and I was with them in one of them, and uh, just was like, what's ha-? like, you know, you're just with a group of guys, and like, oh, look at this, and like somebody just like kind of walks over to this house that we knew, dude, because we're in an area that has like cabins and people yeah. aren't always there. And so they knew that this one was like not occupied. And so they just like went in there. Let's go check this all out. All the thrill. And then they yeah. kicked the door and they all went in there. And they're like, come on. I'm like, no. And then I just had this, like, I was in a pickle. Like, do I go with my friends or not? And then I just beelined it out of there. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not. I could, I'm not job. I could never, I could never do something like, like that. I think this, like, it's, I totally remember the rationale behind the grocery store. Like, you, I literally, you don't have a face to the person. Yeah. You don't think it it's just your, seems, still, yeah. You think corporate, and, you think yeah. it, like, so it, it totally, that's the, what you're thinking. Like, Anybody who's had something stolen from there, I, it's like that. That's the worst feeling ever. If coming back and you're, I mean, I've had two cars right. stolen. Oh, I've had, I had stuff stolen out of my oh, house. Yeah, oh, right. someone, someone broke few. into my house and it was, uh, they it's stole, awful. Bro, awful. We we came, first of all, I became a vigilante for like a year afterwards. You guys all know that because <laughs> as a father, I can see you losing your shit. Oh, <laughs> bro, as a father, I was just like, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna sleep and hopefully <laughs> I come back. Did you get a sword? Yeah, like a machete or something. I got all kinds of stuff. The finest cutlery, all freshly stamped. Dude, I went shopping <laughs> for women. Ninja stars. Movie trap. Dumb chucks. Bro, they stole. They st- my, my son was five. I he know, was five years old. Yeah. They stole his piggy bank. Oh, dude, it's so dirty, that, dude. What a piece of shit. Yeah. You know, he was like, he was so, he looked wow. at me. And he, I remember we, he went in his room and I, and I said, and he comes out and he goes, Papa, they took my, they took my money. Oh my And the God. look on his little face, and I was like, I'm going to murder what someone. A, what a heartless I bastard. Know, I know. Yeah. Actually, I had to talk, I've, I've talked with him about um, being, because this is for, especially for, well, this is true for girls too, but especially for boys, where you're hanging out with a bunch of buddies, and then they all start doing something that you're, and all of a sudden you're in a situation where you're like, uh-oh, I need yeah. to break away or not. Like, that is a tough situation tough, for man. a boy to be in. What does that say there? So it looks like they're getting into uh, checking accounts. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have a lot of details about what they're going to call their bank or you know what they're going to provide as far as services, but checking is the big thing. It looks like. So my buddy who who uh, has a bank, um, you know, says that it's like obviously extremely difficult. But then I've also heard people tell me that like it's kind of like owning a sports team, like it's guaranteed to be profitable. 
It's one of those things that like if you if you can like the hardest part of the bank, supposedly, and the same thing with getting a team is like is acquiring the team yeah. or actually getting the bank, like through going through yeah, all the, the process must be insane. Yeah, the process, the regulations, everything like that. But once you get it, like I thought I heard that like everyone is profitable. Well, think of the leverage Aren't that Walmart, incredibly Walmart could insured. Do. Like uh, yeah, a lot of the transactions. That's why I think they. That's why I think it's so profitable. I mean, I, I'm speaking well, out the side of well, my I'm neck right now. But gonna, I, that's what I what I'm, I've heard. I'm wondering about how they're going to leverage this because if you have a checking account with Walmart, do you get discounts? Do you get special offers on products if you use of uh, course. your checking? I'm sure they'll check do card? I'm sure yeah. they'll do something like that. So they could really leverage uh, the hell out. Speaking of money, hmm. I read a, an article I thought that was very interesting, and it was by um, investment advisors and and you know people who work with teaching people how to kind of work with money and stuff, and they all agreed that a person should spend no more than 10 percent of their gross annual income on a car. Hmm. So in other words, if you make a hundred grand a year, okay, yeah, ten ahead. grand. That's okay. what they all agreed on. Okay, so does that mean wow. ten grand total for the car? If you make a hundred grand a year, you shouldn't be driving cars, or ten grand a year. Ten grand a year. Okay, okay. so ten percent, ten percent, no less than ten or more than ten percent. Okay, so that's like payments. When you, yeah, exactly. So when you and I first originally, I was thinking like that's crazy. Someone who makes a hundred k only, only like they're justifying only a ten thousand dollar car. But the average car loan, let's say, is five, five to seven years. So mm -hmm. say five years, that's a fifty thousand dollar car. Mm -hmm. So that's basically a fifty thousand dollar car, right? Is what your what your is, which that seems reasonable for. Hold on, and let, I me, would let say, me let me pull it up here. It says here. Um, I remember that stat in the the millionaire next door actually talked about. I thought this was really interesting. You know that spend it's more, more common uh, that no, it's like, the purchase price. I was wrong. That's crazy. Spend no more than nobody 10%, does that. Nobody does that. A ten thousand dollar car. Yeah, he that's says not even make a hundred k. He literally says if you make forty two grand a year, you should limit your budget to four thousand two hundred dollars. And now the reason for this is that nothing will lose you more money faster than a car. Mm. Like almost nothing. Yeah, it's like, a terrible investment. It's yes. horrible. Yeah. It loses money the day you buy it. And then they talk about the maintenance costs. Opportunity cost obviously yeah. is massive. Unless it's a classic and you don't drive it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but you, yeah. you know, financing has changed that. That's piece. the thing. Car financing has changed all of that. You yeah. got people making a hundred grand a year buying fifty thousand dollar cars. More than that, yeah. a lot of people have a hundred. Most people that make a hundred grand a year go out and get a hundred grand car. That's crazy. I mean, pretty close. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Really, I mean, a, see a, it all the time. Fifty thousand yeah. dollars. You don't. You don't get much for a fifty thousand dollar car these days. I mean, that's kind of like your. I, I don't even know what is the average purchase price of a car now. I believe it's up towards. I think it's. I think I read that forty. No, it can't be that high. Average, average is up to forty. That's or 50. crazy. Yes. I mean, go real really? quick, bro. Uh, Toyota Camry, basic car. Honda Accord, basic car. Not gonna be fifty grand. You know what I'm saying, uh, huh? Not fifty grand. Uh, Forty-seven thousand. Oh my god, that's that? the that average. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's all the like, economic. You know, the economy cars are in that class. Like it's all like forty to. 50 oh yeah, to you 60. try. You want a uh, electric car? You're definitely up there. Yeah, yeah. you yeah. know what it is. What, the way that they get people is the first time I bought a car. I remember my buddy sitting me down and he explained it to me. He goes. The sales guy is going to try to close you on the monthly payments. He goes, don't worry about that until you get the price you want. Because what they'll do is be like, how much can you pay per month? And then they finagle it into whatever car. I remember. So that so our buddy Jason, a real good, real good friend of ours, uh, been in the car industry forever. I've actually bought several cars from is him. Is he still there. at DGDG? Uh -huh. If you're in the Bay Area and you go go get a car at DGDG, you can ask for Jason. Yeah, he's, he, was the, he was the finance manager forever. And I'll never forget the first car. We were good friends, right? And- uh, we were, I was buying my first truck that I got through him and he, he d runs all my credit and it, exactly like that. He's like, you know, and he's doing it still even as a friend. He's like, you know, where do you want to, is it more about the payment you want? Or the like, I was like, yeah, just keep my pay. I don't remember what it was back then. I think back then I wanted my payments to be under $500 or something, right? Like it needs to be under $500 a month. And then what, like, can we do that? He's like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. They need, then what they, so what they do is they, they, when they run the, they call the bank and they normally do this phone call away from you. So they normally will go, okay, let me go talk to my manager or let me go run your credit and they'll walk away so they can then call the bank and they'll call the bank and say, hey, I've got this kid. He's 25 years old. His his you know five, his score is 700 credit score. He makes $80,000 a year. You know, what can he get? And then the bank will go, oh, we will we will approve him for a five, five year loan for 5.6% interest. And then the sales guy comes walking back in. He says, hey, great news. I got off the phone with the bank. The bank says that you're approved for 6.8% awesome and then you go yeah and they make the cream 
That's how they, they just add. Yes, they and they add whatever. They, and back in the days, they used to be able to do it. Now I think there's more regulation around it today. But mm. back in the days, they were able to juice that as much as they want. Wow, that's yeah. why they hate when I go to a credit union first, then get the loan, and then go to the car dealership. Well, well and course. then what they do to you is this: so if they get you pinned, and why they want you to say payment. They go like, so let's say I, then they can fit whatever they well, want. Well, then to. they go like this: like okay, so let's say I got approved for a five point six for five years for, and that would have had my payment right around there. Then he goes like. You know, or we can get your payment down to like four eighty, Adam, and but it's a seven year. But then it's now, but it's now six point nine or seven point two percent. And they're getting the extra. Uh huh. Wow. So that's what that they they make the they make the, the difference between the two. <laughs> that's funny. And, and he so he called the bank in front of me and on speakerphone, and the guy's like, "Oh yeah, I'm here with my buddy who's doing this night." He goes, "Uh, do you want to take me off speakerphone?" And he's like, "No, no, no, it's okay. Shoot me straight across in front of him. He's a good friend of mine, like that." And then he then he told me my wow, yeah. And then he told me he's like, "That's how we that's how we make our big money is people financing, and then we can get them a better loan or a better percentage, and then they they will finance it at a, at a, at a higher rate." Wow, uh, yeah. Which is by the way, the one of the best that hustles for sense. anybody who needs to get a good deal on a car loan is to. Let the dealership give you whatever you want, and then turn right around and go to a credit union afterwards, and and yeah, go through another bank and say, hey, I pay got it this. off, yeah. and then you got a better rate. Yeah, I mean, even if you know, yeah, even if you don't, yeah, you would pay it off through the credit union, and they'll give you normally a credit union will yeah. give you one of the best rates that you can get it get yeah. out there, and then That's, you're not playing the, the whole game. Always. And they don't want you to do that, by the way. No, they, they know no, you're going to. You don't that. tell them, don't disclose that, but you do that. That's the best way to wow. get a better deal. But That's ten thousand is. I mean that's kind of unrealistic. I don't know anybody that does that. I mean, no. you got a car, but you know, you know, uh, you when you brought that point up, it, it reminded me of the the book Millionaire Next Door, and I, I wish I could, and I'm probably gonna screw it up. Maybe I'll look up later like the exact stats on how this works. But one of the things I was I found really interesting when I read the book was one of the things that uh, most millionaires had in common was that, well, not only do they live well below their means, but one of those ways is like the cars they drove. Mm -hmm. So like as they were up in income, the, the the price range of the cars were much lower. Yep. So you have like people that like, and I can't remember the exact, so don't quote me on this, but it was like someone who makes, you know, 80 to uh, $100,000 a year has a car that's, you know, 80 to $100,000. But then the person who makes like a million dollars a year drives like a 50,000. Yeah. Uh, so it was really kind of interesting. Now, why do you think that is? Do you, do you think it's the the money habits because they, and that's what led so to that them is being the, successful? Yeah, the the sure. number one factor in the book, or this with the, the book, the number one, because there's when you look at millionaires all over the country, they 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 range from everything from plumbers to teachers to lawyers to yeah. doctors to everything. Yeah. Most of them make it in real estate. Yeah, 80, 85% of millionaires in America are self-made. That's right. And most of them make it through real estate, right? They own a property that appreciated over yeah, years. Yeah. So most of it has been made through owning a home early on. And most of the people that got there got there by living below their knees, significantly well below their means. And they got there fast enough that they were able to hold on to their house for decades. And so it's they've, now, built, they've built these. So that's the number one thing that all millionaires have in common is the ability ability to to live well below their means mm, yeah. above all the, the, they all they try and tie it to jobs or you know different characteristics like that's the number one thing that they ha all have in I had a, I had a client mm -hmm. that I trained who was a he was a vascular surgeon very successful obviously probably made a ton of money and he drove this 200 and something thousand mile uh Toyota 4Runner Mm -hmm. Like it was, and it was just beat oh, up. Those things last forever. Yeah. And he just never, you know, he never bought, he never bought anything. He loved it. Yeah. You know? And this guy, I know he's a vascular surgeon. He's, he made a lot of money. Well, this is why I think it's so, uh, the, the journey to increasing your income. It reminds me a lot how you talk about like how important the journey of your weight loss goal is and everything you yeah. learn. I feel like that's how, like when you're, when you're making more and more money, I mean, when I think of my own trajectory, it looks kind of like this, like it's kind of, it's this. You know, if you look at the line, it's been a gradual increase with some dips and, and dips and, you know, peaks and valleys along the way. And along that whole journey, I've learned a lot of lessons and, and have built better behaviors around money. If I look at my behaviors and the way I spent money in my 20s is significantly different than in my 30s and now even in, even more different in now my 40s. And so I think the, and, and the most important part of all that was the the learned knowledge of years of yep. like, you know, thinking I have a lot of money when really I don't have a lot of money or thinking this will never, this gravy train will never end. And then it does, it does eventually end or thinking the economy is going to keep going in this direction. And then it doesn't, it's like, you know, I, I've learned that over hard lessons over years. And so, and that, you know, Katrina will you know, laugh and tease that, you know, cause we've been together for 12 years that 
I'm cheaper now than I ever yeah. was. And she's like, this is so backwards. That's hilarious. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, markets, uh, you know, it's interesting. So I was uh, talking to some of my cousins about um, the Sleep Me, which, you know, previously known as the Chili Pad um, company we've been working with a long time. So Did they just changed their name recently? Sleep Me. Yeah, now. So now it's Sleep Me. So instead of Chili Pad, same product, right? Sleep goes on, Me, bro. What's goes, your, any, 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 uh, sorry to interrupt your commercial, but what, I'm just curious what your guys' thoughts why are. Why they changed it? Yeah. Well, I don't know. Is it because people uh, thought chili pad was like spicy or Uller? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they did a test group and that name just kind of popped out for them. I well, isn't know. isn't there isn't their number one competitor the the sleep number or something like that? Isn't like their number one competitor? No, I think it is. I think well, that sleep number is different. Sleep number changes the mattress firmness. Right. The the sleep me is a pad that goes on the mattress that can cool or warm the bed and adjust. Your body yeah, so maybe there's an association there with the sleep number and then the sleep me is sort of the cool and heat. I don't, I don't know. know, but I don't know. Yeah, who knows? But either way, it's it's a it's an well. Awesome I mean, product. to me, I think it's it's kind of obvious. I mean, if you say uh, chili pad or Uller to someone who has no idea what we're talking about, they 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 would they would not even have a close guess to what mm -hmm. that means. If I just said to a random stranger, "Hey, do you know what a chili pad or an Uller is?" and they'd be like, "No idea." If you said sleep me, I bet you they have some sort of a, it has something to do with sleep. Was yeah. it? I mean, Someone so, will do sleep in you. Yeah. Mm. Well, I, you know, I saw, I, I was talking to him. Down. I was talking to him about it and I had talked to him about it years ago and he never uh, took action. Well, anyway, I brought it up again and then he brought up all these competitors. You know how much the market has grown? Yeah. It has exploded, and which is a good sign. This means that people are seeing value, right? If you can cool or warm your bed, you'll notice significant improvements in sleep. But I was surprised to see how much that market has exploded. There's now mattresses that come with. Uh, this type of technology. Yeah. So where you buy the mattress and it has this technology in it. Oh, I was going to bring up, me and Adam were talking with Corey after we done the podcast a bit, and he was saying, oh, yeah, I've heard about those, like that they actually had challenges amongst the players uh, as to how low and they could they could bring the temperature down. And the, the byproduct of that was they both got the best sleeps they've had in their life. Yeah, you know how he tracks like HRV and all yeah. these things? Yeah. And so it was kind of cool. He's like, you know, they had a bunch of players on the team and stuff. That were, oh, these are pro pro NBA players. Yeah, that were getting in competition of who can sleep with it the coldest, and they were just they were just fucking around like who could drop. And I was Justin and I were laughing. We're like, I sleep at the very yeah. fifty five. <laughs> like we were already as, there as low yeah. as it'll go. And he goes, Yeah, you know what the outcome was? And I'm like, Of course, better sleep. He's yeah. like, Yes, that's exactly what we saw. Was the colder they were willing to put that thing in sleep, the have, better sleep have, they quality. Have you guys got. experimented yet with it warming up? To, yeah, to wake mine's you up? all set. I have. I've, so now, so it warms up to get mm -hmm. you awake. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wake up like like you wake up naturally. It's yeah. the weirdest thing. It's such a trip. Combine that with the the light, the alarm clock. That I definitely glows. do that. Yeah, the light. I think the most important uh, lesson for somebody who owns these or is looking to get one that that I have to communicate to everybody, is, and that it took me a while to really figure it out is it really does matter, especially if you if you sleep hot. I sleep really hot. Um, to let it get to its temperature that you want it at before you get into bed. Yeah, so I do 15 minutes before. Oh, I do hours before. Oh, wow. I do like three hours before now. I used to do an hour, and then sometimes it wouldn't be all the way down to 55 by the time I get in there. Oh, wow. And so then, because if oh, it's- that's right, because you guys yeah. are freezing. If it's trying to get- yeah, if it's about an hour, it, but I should- Because it'll never get, your body temperature is so hot. So if you're somebody who wants it at the bottom 55, and you get in at it, and it's at 67, it's still working its way down, it'll never get down to 55. Your mm -hmm. body temperature is so hot, it'll counter it. I see. And it'll never get to that, that. So you have to let it get all the way to that cool. And then it does a great job of managing the temperature at there once it's there. But I mean, I don't think there's just enough horsepower in those suckers to to drop it when you got your body temperatures that's working against mm -hmm. it the entire Especially time. Especially when you're super hot. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> Check this out. There's a company we work with called Organifi. High quality ingredients, convenience, great tasting. Organifi's superfood blends make it easy and enjoyable to add more variety and nutrition to your day. Great products. They're all organic, plant-based. My favorite right now is the red juice. I'm drinking this uh, quite often because I'm off caffeine, or at least I'm lowering my caffeine intake. So it's natural energy. Uh, makes me feel good. But they have much more. You got to go check this company out. They're the longest sponsor we have that we've worked with for a reason. Go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com forward slash Mind Pump, then use the code Mind Pump for 20% off. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Amanda from Denmark. Amanda, thanks for calling in. It's good to have you. Thank you. Um, nice to see you guys. Um, okay, I'm just going to read up what I've been written down. Okay, thank you. 
Um, my name is Amanda and I'm 25 years old. First, I have to say thank you very much for all the content that you put out. I've been listening for the, put to the podcast for a very long time and I've learned so much from you. Um, I even got my parents to start lifting weights with a personal trainer and um, they don't have any, any joint pain now. So thank you for learning me so I can learn them. Excellent. Um, after listening to you guys, I started lifting weights one and a half year ago, um, and I've done MAPS Anabolic twice, and now I'm in MAPS uh, in phase four of MAPS performance. My original question was that I don't really uh, see any progress in my pull-ups. I know that you had to say that the exercise that you want to be better at, you have to do more of. But my problem is that I can't even do one. Is there any exercise that I can do to strengthen the muscles that I have to use during a pull-up? Or do you have any tips on getting better at that? And also, um, what would you suggest that I do after MAPS performance? I bought MAPS Aesthetic, but I'm not sure if I should do MAPS Anabolic again, and then performance and then aesthetic. Uh, um, I also have to mention that I have never been lifting very heavy before, so I'm still learning to go into my workouts with the mindset mindset of lifting and not getting a sweat on, because I've always been running a lot and doing a lot of like repetitions, hit cardio, you yeah. know. <laughs> no, really, really good question. Okay, Great so question. so to follow up with Maps Performance, you can do Maps Anabolic again, or you can get into Maps Aesthetic. Just keep in mind that Maps Aesthetic is very high volume. So if you start to feel burnt out or a little stiff or too sore, um, then I would back off on the volume and cut the sets down. But let's talk about pull-ups for a second. Um, do you yeah. have access to like a pull-up bar that you could have at home, something you can put in your doorway that you can- No, okay, so I don't have one, but I, I was thinking about buying one. Yeah, so you can get one. They're really inexpensive. They go in the doorway and they have ones that kind of go like- they, they anchor on the other side of the door. So they're very stable. And then what mm -hmm. you do is you attach a, a resistance band to it, a long resistance band that you can step into. You put your knee in. helps lift your body weight. So you can just step into it or put your knee into it, depending on how long the resistance band is. And you want to get one that's strong enough that'll actually lift you so that you can do a rep or two. And then okay. my suggestion is to practice doing a rep or two, um, Frequently, like mm -hmm. literally like two or three times a day. So you walk by the pull-up bar, you put your knee or your foot into the stra the resistance band, pull yourself up once, come back down, and then go about your day and then try doing that again. The key is to keep the intensity low. So you're not going to make it a hard pull-up. You should get a band that lifts you enough to where it's, you know, where you lift yourself and there's some effort, but it's not super hard. And just practice one or two at a time throughout the day. Now to offset that kind of volume, I would reduce the back volume in MAPS performance or MAPS aesthetic okay. or MAPS anabolic just to make up the difference. But if you practice a moderate intensity pull up several times a day on most days, you should rapidly see your strength improve and your ability to do a pull up improve. Justin, are the, the, the bands that we have in the gym, are they PRX or are those kettlebell Kings? Whose bands are those thick kettlebell ones? Kings? And, um, yeah, because we have rubber bandits that we have as like a bundled package. Yeah, but that not that, sell, but that's not good for this her. This is, yeah, the kettlebell Kings is uh, yeah, great. Cause you want, so I think we should clarify it, right? The bands. Cause you're going to, when you need someone to, when you need a band to assist, uh, for like pull ups, Typically, mm -hmm. the 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 little bands that like what we sell actually yeah. are are not enough in my opinion. Like you want something because you want something that you can assist you enough to where you could get like ten pull ups, and that's how I would I would get at least two or three bands, and, and they'll tell you the strength on there as far as like the support, the thicker ones, and then and then start off with the one that really assists you and helps you get like ten, and then you have the other one that just assists you a little bit a little bit less and then you can get maybe five or eight with that one and then you have one that barely assists you that maybe you can only get one or two and work work through the bands like that and get good at all all levels and then eventually be able to do it with no bands and then yeah. still sticking to the advice that sal is saying where you know every day you kind of try to hop up there and grab one or two yeah. now if you want to make it more simple if you have trouble finding the right bands and you know you want to make it really easy you can get the pull-up bar and you could get a chair so you could stand up to the pull-up bar so that it's you know, up to your chin, right? So it's almost like you finished a pull-up and then mm -hmm. hold on and then take your feet off the chair and support yourself for five seconds and then come down and practice that every day. And then to progress from there, you would hold on to the bar and then lower yourself with control and then practice that every day. And then eventually mm -hmm. get to the point where you could lift yourself with the bar. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It okay. does. 
Perfect. But yeah, after you're done with performance, I think aesthetic is perfectly fine. But if you okay. feel like you need to drop the volume, I would go for Maps Anabolic again and then back to Maps Aesthetic. And one of the ways you could do that without actually even changing the program is switch out the focus sessions for the mobility days that are in performance. Since you have all those programs uh, mm -hmm. and performance, I don't know how much you're enjoying the mobility or days. Those are more recuperative type of workouts. Uh, so if you feel like aesthetic is a little taxing, sometimes what I'll do for somebody is just, hey, let's get rid of the you know, the other two days of training and actually turn them into mobility days. That tends to do the job for most people for MAPS aesthetic. So keep that in mind too. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Excellent. Um, yeah, I think that was it. All right. All right. Hey, All right. Amanda, we really appreciate you listening to the show and thanks for calling in. All the way from Denmark. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. You, you know, um, so just, and I hope she watches this just to get more, more detailed. So before I use bands with pull-ups um, for clients, I would actually use isometrics. Uh, great advice. Yeah. I actually, I don't think we've given that <clears throat> advice on here before. And I forgot. No. I did this early days and I had a client who would, mm -hmm. she would practice holding herself at the top and then another time of the day I'd have her practice holding herself midway and then another way where she was yeah. kind of all the way down. Yep. And so she would just practice this all day and isometrics are pretty cool because you get strength gains really fast and the straight gains carry over to a little bit beyond the, it's like the position. Six to I don't remember if it's six to fifteen degrees. Yeah, I think you, know, you said fifteen. Yeah, I think it's fifteen. Yeah. So if you did like top, middle, bottom, and you practice that every day, um, and you can hold it for three seconds or so, yeah, you're going to gain strength in that full range, and then eventually get to the point where you could do. Well, a wouldn't forward. you? So wouldn't you also? So if you're prescribing that, like I would tell a client. Um, to try and increase the time you hold, right? That that would be the mm -hmm. goal. Like, yeah. you know, start off, and even if you can only hold for like yeah, three or five second, seconds, two yeah, seconds. a couple seconds, and then get to where you can hold for five seconds, yep. and then try and get to where you can hold 10 seconds. You get If you can get to a place where you can hold those isometric positions for longer and longer, it'll eventually get to a point. So I think it was great advice. I don't think we've actually uh, utilized that, actually. Yeah, especially at the top. I mean, that's really the last hurdle, mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, for people to be able to complete and get that last bit of pull over, would get their chin over the bar. But so it's perfect for that. I can't help but think of, uh, you know, we just had a great interview with a friend of ours that will air soon, uh, Corey Schlesinger. And, you know, the band, the assisted bands has got to be one of the best. I mean, that's the... Yeah. I it's ideal, you know, but the, the pro I'd say, I don't know how hard the pull-up is for her. Right. For some people, you might need a really like strong band. That's, that's hard I, to maneuver for some sure. people. That's yeah. why I made that point. Well, yeah, no, that's a good point. I believe it's living fit. It's not kettlebell King. So it's like a, a side adjacent business to that. But yeah, they make really quality bands. You want those thick, the bands. thick. Well, yeah, yeah. So she's watching this video. It's not the little skinny bands or the tubes no. that people do like arm curls and uh, like upper body exercises. You want, the thick bands that normally you see people attached to like uh, free weights. Yeah. That you need something with more support. Our next caller is Calvin from New York. Calvin, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, how's it going? Good to be here. Good. Um, you. I'm calling in because I, so last month I just finished the first phase of match performance and I uh, really liked it. So thank you for that. But then I just moved house. I've just after moved to New York there recently. And so I've got a lot stuff going on like getting the house ready new jobs stuff like that so i don't have access to a gym so i can't really complete mass, mass performance but i did just buy some um suspension trainers like olympic rings so i'm looking to incorporate them um it's really good for like upper body workout i feel but then i'm just uh, afraid that like my lower body legs like my squat it's going to be you know it's not going to progress at all so I'm wondering what kind of, uh, what I can do to, um, yeah, just to uh, keep progressing my legs while using suspension trainers or any sort of at-home workout. A lot of yeah. single leg stuff. Yeah, yeah, man, single, single I mean, pistol squats are not easy. <laughs> I don't know, have you ever done a single leg squat? I actually do pistol squats, yeah. Excellent. So so single leg squats, yeah. slow, down the re slow down the tempo, yeah. real control, mm -hmm. real slow, single leg deadlifts. Single leg toe touches. Bulgarian split squats. Yeah, and and, and real and slow down the tempo. You can also do explosive t style stuff, but uh, this depends on your control and stability. But like, uh, you know, a plyo, uh, plyo jump, plyo type mm -hmm. landings. Like that, that stimulates fast switch muscle fibers as well. Now, keep in mind, you will get, lose some strength in certain lifts because you're not practicing those lifts. So if you're not squatting with a barbell, you're even if you kept the muscle up, there's a certain amount of skill that you end up losing by not practicing that lift. So it doesn't necessarily mean you lost muscle. 
It just means you just have yeah. you've been out of practice uh, with that particular uh, skill or whatever. But I mean, there's a lot of single leg exercises you can do, especially if you do them slow and controlled that that are pretty intense. Well, I think too, you'd be surprised. It may feel like you're going to lose gains um, whenever you kind of shift into this direction, but a lot of times you're just reinforcing more stability around your joints that need it. Mm -hmm. um, which then, you know, that's that's one of those that translates when you go back to any kind of bi-loaded uh, type of exercise. Uh, so it, it it there may be a bit of a drop off, but overall, uh, you may be reinforcing things that need attention, which then may help you progress even further when you. Come Come back. I think the hardest part of this is this the mental aspect. You know, it's when you get when you're when you like to squat and deadlift and you've got you got pretty good strength in those areas and then all yeah. of a sudden you lose, you know, the ability to get to that equipment or those tools and now you're forced to just figure it out body weight. I mean, the truth is I think you could even progress uh without that. I think it's very much so possible. But it's the it's the discipline of okay now I'm doing these slow single leg you know pistol squats and single leg deadlift stuff that's like it's just it's it's hard when you when you like gripping onto you know three four hundred pounds and, and and feeling the weight move like that but if you don't ever train that way I think your body actually could see great benefits from training that way it's just when I've been in similar situations. Uh, what I find the most challenging is just I like to, to yeah, lift totally. it, a heavy weight. It's hundred percent. But the truth is, if mm -hmm. I were to discipline myself and like really do slow tempo pistol squats, I mean, I know it would blow my legs up because I know I can. There's been times where I can squat four hundred pounds, but could barely do you know ten slow pistol squats. It's like so. There's plenty of room for me to progress in that area. Uh, and and just and grow and build my legs without squatting. It's just that I just rarely discipline myself to do that long enough. So if you've got the mental discipline to do it, it the the capabilities are there. Believe it or not. Yeah, and, and it, it says in your question, you do jujitsu a few times a week. You may actually notice some improvements in your jujitsu from changing your training. Actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then as, as like as a the program to focus on, like I was looking at map suspension or maps anywhere. Is there either one you'd recommend since I have the suspension trainer or the, is there any leg like development in the suspension training? Oh yeah. yeah oh yeah. Program or? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's full body. Yeah. yeah. That'd, be, that'd be a great one okay. for you. Yeah. We'll send that to you, Calvin. Okay. Great. Nice. Yeah. One. Nope. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for all the content guys. We really appreciate it. You got Thank it, you, man. man. Thanks for calling in. All right. Go on. Have a great day. You see you. Right on. He had a, uh, his accent sounded a lot like uh, Conor McGregor. Oh yeah. <laughs> He's I like, didn't tanks. catch that. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, you know, that the, I get what you're saying, Adam. I think that's a hundred percent because that's what would mess with me. It's yeah. not that I couldn't find exercises that would be good. It's, it's just, doing them. Yeah. It's just doing them yeah. because I love barbells and dumbbells yeah. so much. I mean, I've, there's been times where I'm, I'm just being completely transparent with the audience where I've told myself I'm going to do this yeah. and then I quit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause I just don't, I don't like it as much. And yeah. it's like, you, you know, and I suck at it. Like, the, I mean, just being real, it's a, it's, it's a different feel. It is. Too. Well, and I mean, in terms of intensifying, like you said, super slow controlled and then holding it, yeah. you know, yep. at the very difficult portion of the lift, but also to being super explosive with it, which we don't recommend a lot, but in terms of body weight, yes. that's a perfect uh, situation to, to work on that. If and, you have the and, control and you're an athlete. So the yeah. carryover right. to like that being so still generating a ton if, of force yes if you if you have the control and if it's appropriate for you a very fast explosive body weight squat will activate as much or more fast switch muscle fibers in a slow grinding heavy exercise yeah uh, i mean sprinting for example is a great lower body muscle builder short hard sprints the the the, the drawback is you have to have the prerequisites you have to have the right, right stability and control because if you can't do something perfectly safe slow you definitely can't do it safe fast that's the problem our next caller is austin from florida austin what's happening man how can we help you hey how's it going guys good uh first i just wanted to say thanks for for having me on the show um i'm a fairly new listener so i got some years of catching up to do but um everything that i've heard so far just i just love and and uh continue to follow you guys so um to share a little bit of background um the start of kind of the start of the pandemic really um i was 262 pounds we have a three-year-old or we had a nine-month-old at the time and um, I had no job, you know, just kind of sitting around the house and like, you know, what? I'm nine months out from my 30th birthday and I want to go into my 30s um, trying to be in the best shape of my life. So 
started tracking everything um, through Weight Watchers, actually. And uh, but started tracking everything, started running um, and because, you know, cardio is, is just what burns all the fat. Right. So that's my thought process and uh, ended up falling in love with running, really. And uh, trained for a half marathon, ran that one, wasn't really too pleased with the time. So went back at it three months later, um, dropped about 20 and 30 minutes off of that time. So um, just really loved running. But I, I also started to, as things kind of opened back up, um, I had a buddy who kind of pulled me along to the gym and um, started working out, you know, a couple of times a week. And, and, uh, and I, I, I lost about 50 pounds. I got down to like 212 um and then holidays hit and i just ate whatever i wanted and and put on another you know eight to eight to ten pounds and since the start of 2022 really i've been trying everything that i could do to get that you know to get back to where i was or even try to try to get even more lean and, and whatnot and uh, and so my question is um i currently I, I i run about four to five times a week for 45 minutes to an hour. And then I also go to the gym. Um, I get about an hour session a day, four times a week. And so um, I know that building muscle can burn fat and also know that endurance training can sometimes break down muscle. So am I running too much <laughs> or how is, what is the balance there in terms of, um, of, of doing what I need to really meet a goal of, of, of burning some fat here? Yeah. Austin, is your goal uh, just to lose weight on the scale or is your goal to be lean? So like muscle, def- what, which one? Yeah, is def- sorry, definitely uh, to, to lean out. I'd like to, you know, I'm at like 28% body fat. So I'd like to get down to like um, under the 20s. I'm not trying to compete in any competition or anything and, or in the, you know, 10%, whatever, but 15 to 18% would, would be great and, and just, just be more comfortable in, in, in my skin. So. Okay. Are you, are you going to do any more running competitions coming up? Does that even a thing or, or right now is the goal just, I want to get lean. Yeah. So, um, I did sign up for my first full marathon, um, in February of 2023. Um, and I expect that to be about a 16 week, um, training cycle. Um, so I have about seven or eight weeks until that starts. Okay. So for, for just to, just for body composition purposes, so to, to be lean, uh, more muscle, you are running too much. So I would cut the running down. You're also lifting too much, doing an hour, four days a week, plus running four or five days a week. You should be lifting maybe three days a week and you could keep running a couple days a week, maybe two days a week. And that would probably be more appropriate along with a good, uh, diet. Now, when you're training for a marathon, that's different. I wouldn't worry about body fat percentage. That's more about performance. But uh, long distance running and training for endurance does have, um, it, de- it tends to get people to lose just overall body weight, including muscle. So you'll end up at a smaller kind of same body fat percentage version of yourself doing it that way. So I would do the strength training and make that the focus three days a week, full body. If you don't have MAPS anabolic, that'd be the program I put you on. And then running, you can do one or two days a week of running just to maintain your stamina and endurance, especially if you enjoy it. And then what you'll see is the scale probably won't move much, but you'll start to get stronger and notice changes in body composition. So your waist will get smaller. You'll see more definition. Um, And I wouldn't even look at the scale, to be honest with you. I I wouldn't even look at the scale. I would measure my my, my waist, circumference, or if you could do body fat uh, percentage testing, that's how I would monitor the the progress. The good news is that you have a solid seven weeks um, to kind of reverse diet. So I think that is, uh, I mean, we may potentially want more time than that for the most ideal situation, but at least you're not like, it. this would be a a really tough thing to help you with if you're calling us and you're like, and tomorrow I start my 16 week training for my marathon. It's like, well, fuck, you know, not much we can do. You're going to, you know, just get good at running. Uh, right. so you at least have seven weeks to take Sal's advice. I mean, I think that that's the perfect advice, uh, reduce, you don't have to cut the running out completely because there, you, there are some benefits to you still maintaining some stamina endurance. I think two times a week is plenty. I agree. A maps anabolic type of a routine. And you're just, you're focused on slowly increasing calories and getting strong in the gym. Let your circumference measurements, like he's saying, be kind of your guide and the strength in the gym be your, your, your North star. Like if I'm seeing my my bench, my squat, my deadlift slowly go up. I'm probably getting stronger building muscle and my waist isn't getting exponentially bigger. And then um and then my calories are getting higher. I mean that would be 
the ultimate success in the next seven weeks is can I go from, you know, did you tell me how many calories you, how many calories are you probably eating right now? Are you tracking at all? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I started tracking uh, about six weeks ago, um, switching from the easy of, of Weight Watchers to actually just calories. I, um, I, I do anywhere from 23 to 2,500. Okay. Yeah. See, in a guy your size, I, I would eventually, maybe not in these next seven weeks, but eventually I'd want you north of 3,000, 3,500 calories, right? Because you're, you're not a small guy, right? You're a big dude. So we would want to be up there. So the goal for now for the next seven weeks was, would be, <laughs> can I, can I get you closer to the 27, 2800 calorie mark and not putting on any body fat and stronger before we go into this 16 week training for a marathon. And, and I wouldn't mess with calories. If, if anything, I might go up in your calories when you start the marathon running. So you don't, so you minimize how much muscle you actually potentially are going to uh, reduce. Okay. Does that, does that make sense yeah. to you? Yeah, that, that makes sense. So um, it, just to make sure I'm tracking co completely, it's it would be to run maybe once or, or two times a week and in the gym three three or four days a week. No, we're, we're gonna, so we're, follow MAPS Anabolic. Yeah, we'll send gonna, you the program. Yeah, we'll send you the program. So follow MAPS Anabolic to a T. Yeah. yeah. So follow that, yeah. run maybe once or twice. And uh, you don't, you know, don't drop your calories. You can keep them the same, but then slowly try to raise them yeah, raise to them. feed the muscle and to feed your metabolism. You want to be in a position where your body's burning a lot of calories on its own. You don't want to be in the position where you have to burn the calories manually so often. I mean, running as much as you are, working out as much as you are, and being a big guy, only eating 20, you know, 2,000, 2,300 calories, like, and you want more and you want to lose more body fat. I, I think it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that the, the end of that is unsustainable. You know, what right. do you mean eating 1500 calories a day and working out, you know, for hours and hours, uh, every single week, does it make sense? So, mm -hmm. so if you follow our advice, you're going to slowly be able to get your metabolism to boost and you'll be able to eat more food and it'll be much easier to stay to, to maintain. You're a perfect person to talk to about this too, because you just, you, you have this great story that you just experienced, which is you, you lost a bunch of weight through running like this. Then you go into the holidays, you eat a little bit of whatever you want. And all of a sudden you pack on weight relatively quick. That wouldn't have happened, or it wouldn't have happened as bad had you built more, been more muscle focused during that time and less cardio focused, because you actually would have had a faster metabolism. So you would have more metabolic flexibility or nutritional flexibility, the ability to eat a little bit outside of the diet right. and not let it feel like it packs all on you. But because you had ran, you ran all that weight off of you, you inevitably slowed the metabolism down. And so, you know, eating a few hundred or a thousand extra calories every day, it ended up stick feeling like it stuck to you, which is probably what you felt. Yeah. Definitely been in a plateau feels like all year. So yeah. yeah. Well, well, Austin, keep listening to the show. Cause this is actually a topic we touch on quite a bit. Quite a so, bit, yeah. so I, we'll be able to help you out. Was it your buddy that introduced you to the show? The one that introduced you to weightlifting or how'd you find the show? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, it was, it was. Yeah. yeah, good friend. Hang good out deal. with him more. <laughs> <laughs> he knows he's doing. Thanks yeah, for calling in, Austin. We'll, we'll send you. We'll send you maps anabolic. That's awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you guys. And uh, one thing that I have learned throughout this, through listening to you guys, is there a different. There's a difference between fitness and health. Mm. And I really appreciate you guys focusing on the health aspect um, and not just the fitness, because there's a whole lot of unhealthy habits that can take place. And, uh, and so it. I appreciate. It. Absolutely, you got it, Perfect. man. Thank you, Austin. Thanks, brother. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's uh, it's still a thing, you know. This is what people do when they <laughs> want to lose weight. It's definitely still a thing. It's a big <laughs> thing, you know. It's, it's going to always be a thing. I think. Cut your keep calories. Talking about it. Run it off. I mean, what a great example. I mean, the guy. Yeah. He's a he's a big dude. He's a perfect example. He's two hundred and uh, what was he now? What did it say here? Uh, he was two sixty. He lost fifty pounds. So he's like low two hundred. So like he's, he's a big dude. Yeah. yeah. He's a big dude. He's working out. Uh, like what? Like like how many hours? Like 10 hours a week? Cause he's running plus lifting. Yeah. Yeah. He should be eating North of 3,500 calories. I mean, I don't work out half as much as he does. And I, that's how much I eat. Right. Yeah, so yeah. you want to get to that point. Otherwise it's just unsustainable. Unless you plan on eating 1500 calories and just doing tons of exercise all the time, which you could do. And if it's, a, if it's okay, you know, it's, it could be healthy too. Yeah. It's just hard to maintain. When you're talking about like 2,400 or wherever he's at right now. And then like, you know, all this body fat he wants to lose and get, getting to that point, like to, 
to really visualize that. And like, if I was to like have a client right now, and like, this is the first conversation we're having and to be able to draw that and be like, mm -hmm. okay, so let's just say we, we keep doing this as a math problem and I'm taking you all the way down yeah. shaving, 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 you know, is 1100 or, you know, 1200 calories. Does that sound like something that you can do? Yeah. Paired with seven days of running, right? Yeah. Cause you're, that's yeah, exactly. Cause you have to match that <laughs> with your intensity. And then what you can't movement. account for, what you can't account for on that math problem is how the body's metabolism adapts. Right. Because people will do the math and they'll assume I'll be burning the same amount of calories the whole time. No, no, no. Your body adapts. You lose muscle, like yeah. your metabolism burns less calories. No, which is why I brought up the seven day. Like eventually you have to increase yeah. the activity. Yeah, everything gets worse. Yeah, and the next thing you know, you're seven days a week of high intensity activity and 1,100 calories and you're like, uh, yeah, I'd rather be yeah, fat. No it was way, yeah. <laughs> way more enjoyable. Totally. Our next caller is Jared from Idaho. Jared, what's happening, man? How can we help you? Oh, not a lot. I'm excited to be here. I want to thank you guys for, for the work that you do and for the, the truth and fitness, which is something appreciated. Good deal. Right um, I will, uh, my wife says I get long winded, so I will just read my, <laughs> my email straight away. And then you tell great I'll stories. Any, That's what that means. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you guys uh, ask follow up questions and or look for your feedback after that? Okay. So uh, my personal background, uh, 45 years old, about five foot 10, 195 pounds. I'd say give or take about 20, 25% body fat, uh, high school, small college level athlete, uh, been previously certified as a personal trainer with ACE, uh, certified strength and conditioning specialist with NSCA, uh, practicing physical therapist for the past 10 years, uh, working out about five to seven days for most of my life and, uh, research and designed, uh, my, my own programming for the last 15 years or so. Um, questions. I had two questions. Um, my wife introduced me to Mind Pump about three to five months ago, so I'm fairly new. Uh, but from what I've heard, I like the background and philosophy behind the MAPS programs. I'm getting ready to try someone else's programming for the first time in a really long time. I'm going to get ready to start uh, MAPS Anabolic because we got uh, the RGB bundle. Um, one of the things that I'm most interested in, in monitoring and tracking is my physique. Uh, hoping to lower my body fat percentage. So the first question is, what would be uh, the best slash most accurate way uh, to track body fat percentage, ideally at home, but simple and easy methods? And then my second question is, uh, I'd planned on starting anabolic just because it seems like what I would like the most, just given my background. Uh, but from what I've heard from previous podcasts, you guys often recommend uh, the most beneficial program would be the one that's least like what I've been doing for a long time. And so from what I gather, that'd be something like uh, map symmetry for me. So I was wondering if that would be, if I'd be better off still starting with anabolic or uh, getting and kind of starting symmetry instead. Yeah. Are you, right. uh, before, do you have any, um, any aches or pains or any chronic uh, type injuries right now? Uh I ache because my daughter's turning 18, but other than that, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. I you can't solve pain. that, dude. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. No math program will help you with that, except getting bigger so to scare the boys away. I mean, he's, yeah, he's, a, he's a DPT, so hopefully he's yeah. addressing most of that stuff. Yeah, so. I mean, you, you have, I mean, your yeah. background in uh, correctional exercises, I mean, it exceeds ours, so you, you kind of know how to handle that. I think you'd be fine starting a MAPS anabolic. MAPS symmetry would be a great place to start also, but you could also follow it after MAPS anabolic. Um, and then, you know, with your background and experience, you could also, of course, modify the program as you see fit if something doesn't feel right. Um, but yeah, I think you get great results trying MAPS Anabolic, especially if you haven't done a kind of full body based workout before. If it was bodybuilding style, you probably did more of a split type routine, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. I mean, not even just upper body, lower. It's, you know, chest and tricep. Try to set back. Oh, yeah. oh you're going to love it. And legs. Anabolic's so going yeah. to blow your mind. Yeah, anabolic, you're going to respond great to that. Yeah, it's going to blow your mind. The, the muscle and strength gains in that are going are gonna to blow your mind. It's just the superior way to train for most people. Um, so give it a shot. I'd go through MAPS Anabolic. And then after that, MAP symmetry would be a, a phenomenal follow-up. As far as body fat percentage, I mean, that that's really going to come down to diet, right? I mean, you, you, even with a, a, a crappy program, you can get pretty shredded if, you, if, you, if you're dialed nutritionally. So, yeah. I mean, that's going to be mm -hmm. how diligent you are with your tracking. As far as a tool that you can do at home, to be honest, um, I've even used the shitty scales that are that are terrible. Electronic impedance. They're, they're terrible. They're inaccurate. But you know what? It, as long as they are consistent and you're consistent with when 
when you use it. I don't get hung up on when I get on the scale, it says that I'm, you know, 27% and I know that I hydrostatic weighed, you know, a, a month ago and I was at like 8%. To me, although that would never happen that much discrepancy, but you get the point mm -hmm. that it doesn't matter to me yeah. that they're way off. What I care about is the one at home, what it starts out. And then as I'm manipulating my nutrition, you know, where, where is it moving? And I'm really watching this, the big swings because the typically – when you go into a cut or a diet like that, the most common thing, even professionals like ourselves that have certifications and knowledge and experience is uh, is too much, too fast, right? So I, I tend to go into cut and you want to kind of do everything at once or you cut really extreme and then I see weight kind of come off too fast and I'm like, I don't need to do that. I want a slow, gradual process. And so I would use any of those. Just be, be very consistent about the the time that you do you do it and most ideally that's morning no food no water no nothing in your system first thing naked type of deal and the same day of the week consistently yeah, yeah that in conjunction just with your basic circumference measurements yeah, that's in, it. in terms of like seeing growth where you want to see growth and then seeing like let's say it's your waist that you want to see like the most um, you know, difference in terms of like a, a decrease in size. So um, that that's something you can consistently kind of revisit, you know, weekly or so uh, just to give you a, an idea of where the trends are yeah. going. So remember, to go back with what Adam said, to be just to really, really hammer that home, the consistency with electronic impedance body fat testing is going to be in how, in, in the time of day, the amount of water and food you've had in your belly um, that you test this. So in other words, if you test it first thing in the morning, on Monday morning, then that's what you always do. That way you're controlling all the controllables. Right. And that way you know that the scale, because the scale is going to fluctuate depending on your your water and your body and food and that kind of stuff. That's what makes them inaccurate. And then just watch the trends. Don't get hung up on a two, on a 1% or 2% swing. Just look over the course of weeks. But I, I'll be honest with you. I like circumference. I really do. I like circumference better. If you store body fat like the typical male, which is mostly around the waist, you can honestly do two things. My strength, is it going up in the gym? And then is my circumference around my waist going down? If both of those are happening, then you're probably building muscle and getting leaner. Yeah. That, that, that's the easiest, Pretty that's the clear. most simple, easy way to do, uh, to test yourself. And you could do circumference measurements, I don't know, twice a week, just to see where that, where that looks. And do the same thing, do it at the same time every day. I think first thing in the morning is best because what you eat can affect uh, like gut bloat and stuff like that. So I would go yeah. first thing in the morning, Right, right, you know, above the navel or right at the navel, and that's it. That and my strength. Am I getting stronger? Is my waist going down? Then I'm going in the right direction. Yeah, a, wa a waist waist measurement paired with some photos. I love. I mean, if when I was coaching online with clients, that was the the check in. Right, every every Friday first thing in the morning before they ate, they would they would send me over their their you know their circumference measurements with photos of front, side, and back, yeah. and that and 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 really, I'm looking at like two weeks. Because in a week, you could easily see a, a positive or negative swing that could throw you off that makes you try to adjust the program when you maybe you don't, just you're, you're holding a little extra water or something. Maybe you had a little more sodium the day before or something or a little couple more carbs. Like Those things could easily go off like that. So I'm looking at like two-week snapshots. Like in, if I'm looking at your photos from two weeks ago compared to where it is today yeah. and you, you objectively look better and your waist is either staying the same or even potentially getting lower. Like we're on the right track. Totally. Yep. Just had to make sure to wear nipple pasties when I sent them to you. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate that. Be classy about yeah. it. So Jared, I'm going to send you map symmetry. So you have that option. Oh, nice. Yeah. So you could start with it if you want. I think you'll like maps. I think start with maps anabolic after anabolic, you could go into symmetry then go into performance. You have all those other programs in there mm -hmm. and then have some fun with it. I think with your background and your experience, once you go through our programming, I think you'll be able to modify it and start to figure out kind of how, what's going to work best for your body. And that's what we recommend anyway, is that when people yeah, follow gotta, our programs that they start to individualize them. I've got to, I've got to commit to following it to a T first because it's, it's, it's been a long time. So it'll, it'll be, it'll be hard for me to give up that control, but I've, I've, I've committed myself to, giving it a, for the first through first time through doing it to a T. Yeah, so well, I, I'm so glad you I said that, you that and you yeah. have that attitude because I agree with it. Cause someone with your knowledge and experience, you're going to want to tweak it. It'll yeah. be very tempting to want to tweak. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you know, I, even someone like at your level, I would say just trust, please trust the process all the way through and then go back and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think, I think Matt, I think phase one of maps anabolic is going to convince you. I think after the, after the second week, when you start to see the strength gains go up, you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to keep, I'm going to stick with this and see what happens. That's, that's my personal opinion. Nice. 
right, man. And then with the with the impedance scales for at home, as long as I use the same one, do they stay relatively consistent? Yeah, as long as you as long okay. as it's like I said, first thing in the morning, you know, same food, yeah. same water, same then- time. That, that what Sal is saying is is the thing that will throw. Them. I can take one of those things and manipulate it by four or five percent within mm-hmm. five minutes just by pounding some water, have, have some, some sodium, carbs. have yeah. some carbs. And it, 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 that's what really throws those things off. So if you're really consistent at, you know, every Friday at 7 a.m. when you wake up before you get in the shower or something, you check it. Uh, you'll you'll be pretty – it'll be pretty consistent for you. Consistent enough yeah, with, with a guy with your experience and knowledge, consistent enough to give you an idea, uh, am I heading in the right direction or the wrong direction, mm-hmm. and do I need okay. to correct nutritionally? Nice. Yep. All right, Jared. Thanks for calling in, man. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thanks for all you do. Yeah. yeah good keep luck, a, keep us posted, man. I really, I really like to hear your experience as you go through it. For sure. For sure. All right, Jared. Uh, he's gonna love. Oh Matt yeah. Sandoval. If you've been training that long with a body part split, that switch is gonna. He's gonna blow up. Oh, I yeah. mean, he's gonna build People muscle. See substantial change. Massive yeah, when they switch over like that. For yeah. Sure. And the I, reason I put phase one where it is is because I know that that convinces people to continue on. I love that too. That he said that. He is, you know, for him to say it, not us have to tell him. He, he's committing to, I'm going to follow to a T because that's the most tempting. When you have that much education, that's yeah. the hardest thing is to take your ego out of it and be like. Well, he's a physical therapist. So I'm sure he has patients who yeah. do the same thing. So oh, yeah. like, All right, I got to be the patient. I mean, yeah. let's be honest. Anybody sends us a program, like we'd go through that same process yeah. of like, oh, I don't know. Like, yeah, I, no, I know my right. body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so I, I hope he does. And I think that he's going to see incredible results. So totally. I'm excited. Look, if you like Mind Pump, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out some of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal, and they're all free. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. This one's really important, and that is to phase your training. If somebody trains for a full year doing a bench press, and they're always aiming for five reps... If you compared that person to a person who did bench press where they did three or four weeks of five reps, but then they did three or four weeks of 12 reps and then three or four weeks of, let's say, 15 to 20 reps, and then they'll throw in some supersets, at the end of that year, you're going to see more consistent progress from the person who's moving in and out and less injuries.